Last week was all about impact and the week before and the week before that. And it's about this idea of us going out and serving in our community in such a way that we actually impact our community. For the next three weeks, this week, next week, and the week after that, I'm going to be doing some training here, okay? Because I don't want to just send us out there and assume we'll all do the right thing. Uh, I love all of you. You're all wonderful people. But there's no substitute for training, right? And so I want to give us some volunteer training as followers of Jesus so that when we go out and serve, the idea would be that when we serve in the world, we get the same results that Jesus got when he served in the world. Think that's a good idea? That's a great idea. I want to, I want to start by reading a poem that's one of my favorites. You may have heard it or you may have heard parts of it. <clears throat> but it so crystallizes for me with clarity what it means to follow Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in yet another obscure village, where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never even visited a big city. In fact, he never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things we usually associate with greatness. He had no credentials except himself. His career ended when he was only 33 after just three and a half years of ministry. When he needed them most, his friends ran away and one of them even denied he ever knew him. He was turned over to his enemies who took him through a mockery of a trial and condemned him to death through public execution. He was nailed to a cross between two criminals. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, which was his only possession on this earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. And yet, more than 20 centuries have come and gone since he lived on our earth. And today, Jesus remains the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments and congresses that have ever sat, and all the kings who have ever ruled, all put together, have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. If there were no other reason for me to believe in Jesus, that would be reason enough. Yeah. Now listen. He impacted the world so powerfully. But there's a truth that you and I need to grasp. And here it is up on the screen. Jesus has always wanted his followers to change the world. Now I want to pull over here for just a minute. Because here in Sonoma County, it's a really big thing to not force your faith on anybody, right? right? Can I tell you? Jesus would agree with that. Don't force your faith on anyone. But you could make your faith available to them. It's, it's not just... 
I'm not going to force my faith on you, but oftentimes in Sonoma County, I'm not even going to talk about my faith. That's a private thing. No, no, no. The faith of Jesus was never private. The faith of his followers was never private, but it was never forced. We're going to talk about how that works today because it's truly amazing how this principle works. How do I know Jesus wanted his followers to change the world? Well, here's what Jesus said. He said, you, speaking to his followers, are the light that gives light to the world. Pause for just a minute. Is a flashlight a handy thing? Yeah, most of the time. Have you ever had someone shine it right in your eyes, though? How helpful was it then? No. And when we have a Christian faith, and our Christian faith actually gives light to the people around us, it's so helpful. But when we take our faith and shine it in their eyes, it's not all that helpful. Jesus said, you are a light to the world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. In the same way, you should be a light for other people. Hmm. That, my friends, is a worthy objective. If you want something to pray this week, here's what you can pray. You can bow your head and say, God, would you make me a light to other people this week? That's a big challenge. Okay? We have a worthy objective, but we also have a formidable challenge. And you know what the challenge is? Jesus also addressed this. Look at what Jesus said. The world hates my followers. That's a strong word, don't you think? The world hates my followers. Why? Because they are not of the world any more than I am of it. We're going to press into that a little bit. I want you to know that it's not always hate. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Sometimes it's a false understanding or a false belief about the followers of Jesus. Or sometimes someone who's claimed to be a follower of Jesus is just obnoxious. And when you and I come along and say, we're a follower of Jesus, they go, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So when I founded this church 25 years ago, it was in the aftermath, and this is going to reveal my age and the age of some of you sitting in the audience. It was in the aftermath of Jimmy Swaggart and Jimmy Baker. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what the number one question I was asked by people in the community when I would say, I'm here to start a church. You're not a Jimmy Swaggart or Jimmy Baker, are you? <laughs> yeah. We have such a worthy objective, but we have a formidable challenge. Because Jesus points out something about the nature of people and the nature of his followers. And he says there is a tension between people who don't follow Jesus and people who do. Now, I, I, I just want to say right up front that that tension should all be one direction. If you truly live like Jesus, you should never be projecting tension toward people who don't. You should be projecting love. It got really quiet in here. Did you notice that? That's the truth. Okay? If there's any tension, if there's any misunderstanding, it should always be from the people in the world toward people who follow Jesus. Because here is the truth. We have a common nature. Friends, when you look at people who don't follow Jesus, 
there is a sense in which you and I are absolutely no different from them at all. We are human beings. We are broken human beings. And if you don't know of your brokenness, if you're married, ask your spouse. (laughs) They can help you. If you have a friend, ask a friend. If your parents are still living, ask your parents. If you have siblings, if you're really having trouble identifying your brokenness, you have all sorts of experts around you. (laughs) Right? Yeah. We have this common human nature. But because of Jesus... And this overwhelming grace that Spike sang about so beautifully, because of Jesus, we have a very different ideology. It means we think differently. It means we look at people, at other people differently. It means we look at life differently. It means we look at our job differently differently. It means we look at life after death differently. We have a common human nature, but the tension comes in the vast difference in our ideology. Jesus knew that. So here's what Jesus said one day when he was teaching. He said, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Do they have a different ideology, sheep and wolves? Yeah, you bet they do. Yeah. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be the wolves. I want you to be the sheep. We're going to get into more of what that looks like. He goes on to say, so be wise. Or as one translation puts it, clever. Be wise as a snake. And in ancient cultures, snakes were considered not just the most devious, but they were considered uh, to, to, to be able to do things and to get places other critters couldn't get. And they became a symbol of that sort of cleverness and wisdom. He said, I want you to be clever and wise, but I want you to be harmless as doves. Wow. Some of you have cats. And some of your cats have had their claws taken out of their front claws. Now, I know, I know some of you pet purists are going, mm. the cat can't climb a tree or anything yeah, like that. I get it, I get it. I'm not here to, to, to promote one or the other, okay? But if your cat has had the claws taken out of its front paws... It is as harmless as a dove. That cat can hit you on the hand with that paw and it will never scratch you. Jesus is saying, look, I want to so affect the inside of you and how you see people and how you behave around people and how you treat people that you are literally harmless to them. So that brings up a really important question. And here it is. How do we impact our world positively and powerfully? Now, again, I know Christians that really want to impact the world, but not necessarily positively. And yet Jesus had this brilliant idea that his followers would be a light to the world and would affect the world positively and powerfully. Now, we're going to look at two strategies of Jesus that he used in his own life and that he passes on to us, and they're actually in, contained in two very common Verses of scripture that if you've come to church very often, you probably have read these. And I read uh, part of one of them today. But let's take a look at the screen. 
Jesus said, the world hates my followers. I read that to you early because they are not of the world any more than I am of it. My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. You see, there is this whole idea in some branches of Christianity that real Christians isolate from the world so they won't be tainted by them. But strategy number one of Jesus is so the opposite of that. It's not isolation from the world, but influence within the world. Yeah. When we isolate in our church buildings and we talk about how terrible the world is out there, and then we all go out and do our jobs and come back together again and try to survive how terrible it is in the world, we are missing how Jesus impacted the world. There was no isolation in Jesus at all. While the religious leaders of his day isolated in their synagogues and temples, and they asked people to come and be holy with them inside their little sanctuaries, yeah, these these holy places that were sort of protected from the world. Jesus never did that. Jesus went out where the people were. His idea was never isolate from. It was influence within. Friends, that's why impact is all about serving in our communities and not just in the church. Yes, Serve here, but also go serve in the community. And I want to say I'm so delighted that many of you signed up last Sunday. And I know for a lot of you, it, it was, oh my goodness, that's the first time I've ever thought about this. And, and that, that's a big step. I want to say you can still sign up. And we're going to keep this kind of on the front burner um, periodically throughout the year and throughout the years. Because as a church, we never want to be the isolated church. We want to be the church that influences. Now, in another scripture, when Jesus was teaching, he said this, and I read this part, the front part to you at, at the beginning, you are the light that gives light to the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. In the same way, you should be a light for other people. And then Jesus tells us specifically how. He says this, live so that they will see the good things you do and they will praise or be drawn to your Father in heaven. Wow. It's not about what we teach in this room it's about how, how we live and serve out there. Everybody got that? Yeah. Here is strategy. Strategy number one is don't isolate influence. Strategy number two is Jesus always envisioned this invasion of influence born on the strength of unconditional love, acceptance, and generosity. I just want to give you something to think about. Those are three things that almost everyone in our world finds impossible to resist. It's really hard to resist genuine love. It's really hard to resist genuine acceptance. And it's really hard to resist generosity. And I'm not just talking about giving people money or giving people food. I'm talking about interacting with people with a generosity of spirit. That's really hard to resist. So how are we going to do this? This is where the training comes in. We have five things that Jesus did that are so helpful for us. Number one, the first three are this. By seeing people as Jesus saw them. Now, Take your eyes off the video screens for a minute and just listen to me. 
Everyone in the world has a sniffer. Do you know what I mean by a sniffer? Okay. When you pretend to love someone that you don't love, they sniff it out. You understand what I'm talking about? They can sniff that out in a heartbeat. You see, it's not enough for us to just go treat people like Jesus treated them if in our hearts we don't feel toward them how Jesus felt toward them. Am I making sense to everybody? Yeah. We have to actually see people as Jesus saw them. And over and over again, the Bible says Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd. They were people worthy of a shepherd. They were the children of God that were lost and scattered on the hills that needed someone to come alongside them and be their shepherd. In this church, we say it like this. When we see people as Jesus sees them, then everyone is loved. No matter what they've done, no matter who they are. No. It's not hard to love people. Everybody here does it. You know what's really hard? Loving all the people all the time. That is hard. I've told you this little poem before. It's so good for me. It says, to dwell above with those we love. Oh, that will be glory. But to live below with those we know, that's a different story. (laughs) Yeah. But when we see everyone as Jesus sees them, Not as good and evil. Not not as holy or unholy. Not as lost or found. Not as saved or lost. Not as Jesus followers or not Jesus followers. When we can begin to see all people as the children of God, then we will love them as he does. And when we do, they will sniff that out in a heartbeat too. Secondly, by seeing in people what Jesus saw in people. We have a statement around here. The first one is, everybody's loved. What's the second one? Nobody's perfect. By the way, if anyone knew of people's imperfections, it would be Jesus, right? This is Mr. Perfect. He can look at your life and mine and he can spot problems in a heartbeat. And you know what? When we live in denial of our own issues, we never actually ever deal with them. And when we live in denial of other people's issues, we actually forfeit the opportunity to help them. But when we understand that everybody's loved, even though nobody's perfect, we start to have a wonderful balance in this life that we have to have if we're going to help people. And then the third thing is by seeing for people what Jesus saw for them. And that is, there was no one so evil, there was no one so damaged, there was no one so broken that they could not be redeemed. Because with God, anything is possible. For those of you who have watched episodes of The Chosen, Year one, episode one, is the story of Mary Magdalene. Can you remember back? And the Bible in two different places says that Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary. I don't know if you've ever been around a person who was possessed of even one demon. I have. 
It's a scary thing. I can't imagine someone possessed of seven demons. They do such a powerful job in that episode of helping us grasp how tormented she was and how destructive she was to people around her. And yet, Jesus came along, looked at her, and he saw for her what no one else could see. And that is, anything's possible. And she became the beautiful woman that we read about in Scripture. And the very first, are you ready for this? The very first person that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. How about that? That's pretty cool. There are two other strategies that we need to employ. And here, number four, is by living the values of Jesus, but not demanding them of others. If there's a prayer I could pray for the churches in America, it, I, this is going to sound so odd but coming from a pastor, but I would pray this prayer. I love our country, but quit trying to change our country into a Christian country by changing its laws. Amen. Amen. I, that's not a political statement. That's a Jesus statement. Okay? Jesus was born into a world of slavery. Jesus was born into a world where women were bought and sold as property. Jesus was born into a world where children were bought and sold as property. Jesus was born into a world where women were never allowed to testify in court. Jesus was born into a world where sexual uh, perversity was, was rampant. And yet... Jesus never once took to the streets to march for or against anything in the culture. I think our churches could learn a lesson. Did you notice how quiet it got in here right there? I want us to think about that. He had a far better plan. You see, the natural human instinct in all of us is to do this thing that we call a hostile takeover. And a hostile takeover is when I take what I think is true and right and I force it on you. And if I can get it to work, you have to comply especially if I can make it the law. Friends, that's not the Jesus way, period. He never did that. He doesn't call us to do that. What does he call us to do? To live the values of Jesus, but not demand them of others. Listen, as you go out to serve in these partner causes, I want you to hear me. You're not going to agree with everything that partner cause does. Please don't protest. Please don't draw a line in the sand for a holy cause. Recognize that you have been called to actually influence by living the values of Jesus without demanding them of others. Does that give you something to think about? That's super important. Super important. Okay? And the last one, by believing that influence gives birth to curiosity. Curiosity gives birth to seeking, and seeking gives birth to internal growth an internal change. One of the greatest things that you and I could do is to love so deeply and accept so fully and to be generous so profusely that we raise the curiosity level 
of people around us. How do you do that? Why would you do that? And curiosity will give rise to seeking. Seeking gives rise to finding Jesus. And in the whole process, we get to have this beautiful and wonderful influence that never dominates the people around us, but always invites them into this space with Jesus. And by the way, if our friends get curious about Jesus, in the end, it's the best thing that could ever happen to them. Are you on board with that? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's who we should be. Listen, as we close, I have one more slide. We serve in a chosen context. It's a chosen context. It's not a natural one. We serve in a chosen context of unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, and unconditional generosity. And why do we do that? Because love is our greatest language, and I don't want you to miss this. And sometimes it's the only language people will hear. Got it? Let's pray. Jesus, we want to serve. We want to make a difference in the world. We want to just be part of this invasion of influence that's born on the strength of unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, and, and unconditional generosity. So in this week, would you open our eyes and open our hearts so we can live around people just like Jesus did. And we pray it in his name. Amen.